Welcome back to Season 2 of the Discount Property Investor Podcast. Our mission is to share with you what we have learned from our experience and the experience of others to help you make more money investing like a pro. We want to teach you how to create wealth by investing in real estate the Discount Property Investor way. Make sure you never miss an episode and download the Discount Property Investor app in Google Play or iTunes today. To jumpstart your real estate investing career, visit freewholesalecourse.com, the most complete free course on wholesaling real estate ever. Thanks for tuning in. We are back with a brand new episode. This is your host, David Dodge. My co-host, Michael Slane, is out in the field today. We are doing deals on top of just coaching and teaching people how to do it as well. We are the real deal. So welcome Discount Property Investors, and I have a special guest today, Paul Thompson out of Little Rock, Arkansas. How are you, Paul? Hello. I'm doing great, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on the show. So Paul is a real estate investing and money expert. Paul also has his own podcast. What's that podcast called, Paul? It's called Ready Investor One. Ready Investor One, I love the name. So Paul, basically had a corporate office job. Isn't that right, Paul? I did. Yeah, I was a, um, I worked in the, like the, I was a little drone inside of a corporate cog. Probably like most of our listeners. So Paul yep. was able to overcome this job basically and get out of the day-to-day -day rat race and the grind. And he did so by buying rental houses. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about some of the ways that you can build passive incomes, how you also can break the chains of corporate America and we're going to talk about Paul and how he secured 20 deals in his first 18 months of investing. That is a big number for a year and a half, Paul. That's awesome. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us what kind of investing you like to do. And then also, I want to really, really touch on, you know, what you had mentioned earlier to me before we started the podcast, also about, you know, different ways to structure deals. That's awesome. So let's jump in, Paul. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure thing. So I was... Um, a corporate America. I was in middle management. I had an engineering background and you know, it's one of those, it, it was a life and a job that was good enough. It was okay. And my, um, my wife tells me, you know, if you hadn't done anything differently, I, we would have just done that for 40, 50 years and we retired and, and gotten the gold watch and the whole thing, whole thing. But I just didn't find that to be rewarding or fulfilling. And I always had these dreams and like, if I, 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 I wish I one day I could, and like, I want an airplane or I want to be able to take an extended vacation. And one time when I was coming back from an extended, from a, from a one week vacation that I just was kind of ticked off and I couldn't explain why I was, you know, I was you're having to depressed. go back to work. What's that? So you're probably depressed. Um, yeah, I was, I was, doing, I was having <laughs> to go back to work. Right. right. <laughs> like, Oh, I got to go back to work now. This is this right. Sucks. Right. And what I realized is that I didn't have the freedom to be able to stay another week. And that's what my kids were asking me to do. And uh, no, I, I just shut it down. Not, not a possibility. My, but what was frustrating was my wife didn't work. Um, I had the money to stay another week. My kids were out of school, but I had to go back to work. And that was kind of like the, the moment where I thought, you know what, this is just, it took me a little while to put words to it. But on that 10 hour drive back from, from the um, beach to Little Rock, I, I realized I've got to do something different. I've got to figure out a way to um, create additional income other than the day job that I have, because I knew I was vulnerable. If something happened to that job, which in my story, you'll later find out that uh, two and a half years later, I was laid off and it was the best day of my life because I was given the freedom to go and do what I wanted to do. You and say it was the best day of your life. It was, it was be because I had spent the last two and a half years creating additional streams of income. And I was planning on quitting the subsequent January, which was like three months later. But you uh, had but I was kind of forced into it early. Right, exactly. I, I, the way I tell people is I was standing on the edge of a cliff thinking about jumping and someone came by and pushed me. There so you I go. had to figure out if my plane really flew as well as I thought it did. <laughs> right. Oh, <I laughs> so a little that. bit of an That's early awesome, launch. Man. Yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was a very freeing experience. The only thing about that, that I, I'm irritated about is that I didn't get to walk in and hand that, re that, that resignation letter, which I had written, you know, two years per 
prior uh, to my boss. Um, you know, it's not that big of a deal because um, I'm not, w would I have had the audacity to actually resign in January? You know, I'll never know. Uh, yeah, was, that's a tough I question. I was real man. serious about it. Would I have done it? Yeah, could I have yeah. done it? Right, right. But I'm, I'm happy that it worked out the way that it did. I, I'm never happy that anyone gets fired, obviously, or laid off. But it, it, like you stated, it, it pushed you. It seems like it pushed you in the right direction. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's something to be grateful for. Sure. And I've had more fun since then than I ever have. And I, I won't, um, you know, sugarcoat it and say that it's all, it's all been smooth sailing and that I, I was, um, I've never had a moment. I think, do I really have enough? Um, but I, I get up every day thinking, um, if it is to be, it is up to me and it is not m m my responsibility to, or, or it's not, someone else's responsibility to take care of me. I've got to do it for myself. And I never wanted to be someone who lived off some sort of a system. I wanted to be able to take care of myself. And I don't know of any better way to do that than using real estate. It's, it's just kind of the, the last frontier where the average person, like the people listening to this podcast can actually create their own freedom and create meaningful wealth over time. I love that. that you just said a really, really awesome quote that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep here. But if it is to be, and it's up to me. That's awesome. That's a right. great quote. I love that. I'm going to use that moving forward, man. I'm going to steal that from you. That's tweetable. <laughs> it's tweetable. That's right. That's an awesome quote. Cool. Well, tell us about your escape from corporate America and tell us about what you're doing in real estate nowadays. Okay. So uh, um, I decided to go down the single family uh, route. And the reason I chose that, and the reason I chose real estate is because when I would decided that I need to do something else besides just have a day job, I had, I looked at the whole gambit of choices. Was it, um, should I start my own company? I seriously considered doing that. Um, I thought about buying a franchise. Um, I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to buy a franchise. I just felt like I was going to be I've buying there, myself I've another job. That, it's Have you? Yeah. Yeah. You know, wow, the, the people making money in franchises are the people with the franchise, not the franchisee. Not the franchisee. That's so true. <laughs> Three or 6% of gross is really closer to 50% of net. It's pretty crazy. Right. Right. It so really is. So. You're doing all the work, right? And so mm -hmm. that's very similar to being an employee. You know, you're building somebody else's dream. Okay. So I thought, well, maybe I can start my own company. Well, it turns out I was short on ideas. I didn't have a new um, widget or new mousetrap to present to the world. Mm -hmm. So I, I just thought, what else can I do? And then it hit me. I was like, you know, I've kind of been thinking about real estate off and on for several years. Um, but I just kind of, you know, went had you know, got married and had kids and life took over. And then I kind of looked back and thought, Oh yeah, that, that would, that should still work. And I remember in 2008 when the, the collapse was happening, I thought to myself, this is an opportunity of a lifetime and I am not prepared. <laughs> I, I was largely not affected. Thankfully, my job was not inf impacted and all the investments that I had, I just let them ride and never, never thought about it, okay. which was the smartest thing that you could have done um, if, if you're in the, to the stock market. But if you were in real estate, that was a time to buy, right. um, but I didn't know how. And so I spent some time doing some, what I was called armchair um, reading and learning about it, but then life took over and whatever, and it didn't do it for another you know, like five years. And so five years later, I thought, you know what, it's, it's only going to get, the, the market's only going to continue to heat up. Now's the time to get in. You know, like the, the, the when, when's the best time to plant a tree? It was, it was 20 years ago. Well, if it's, if you, if you haven't, then do it now. Right. Um, That's a great, another great, cool. when's the best time to plant a tree? 20 years yeah. ago. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> I love it. Well, it's the old saying, saying in real estate, you know, you don't wait and buy real estate. You, 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 um, buy, buy real, real estate and wait. Right, right. Right. So, well, I thought, well, I've been waiting for too long. So I, after I learned more and done some more study, I thought, you know, this is a good idea. And single family is something that I understand. That's not a big um, stretch for most people to understand what aspects of a house that people want. And right. I, so I don't know what that is for mobile homes. I don't know what that is for power apartments, but mobile or single family, we understand. And I like all the potential creative exit strategies that the single family gives you. You can go um, and sell it to another investor or you can sell it to a, a retail buyer, which gives you a, typically a, a bit of a premium. Right. So there's a lot of different creative ways of, 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 you know, monetizing single family. And so what I did is I started at first doing all single family and all buying um, with creative means, but my, my angle was buy and hold. And I still think the real wealth generation is buy and hold. 
But no one tells you about those really lumpy expenses that buy and hold properties tend to have. And so when you're getting, when you're scaling up before you get to about 20 or 30 properties, um, you don't have enough properties to help kind of insulate you from those big expenses. So, you know, your, your income comes in little drips and then your expenses come in big spikes. That's a great point. You, you nailed it. I can't agree more. So you kind of need enough uh, volume. You know, I, I've heard the thing, you either need to do 40 or 40. Uh, in between is kind of your, um, the no man's land. So if you're just going to have four properties and it's just kind of a hobby on your side, you do some of the work yourself, fine. But, or if you're going to make it a business, then you need to go and like get, get enough scale, 20, 30, 40 properties where you get enough um, uh, economies of scale so that one or two expenses don't crush your, your, your cash flow as it come in. And so I got enough income from the 25 properties that I have that I, that I bought well and I have enough equity and cash flow into it that I can, I can air quote skim some of the, the income off of there for my free cash flow. And that's kind of like the basis of my income now. Love it. So I would imagine that you're financially free at this point in your life. Yeah, I would call, I, go, I, I, I describe it as a lean financial independence. So I, I could just sit back and do nothing and not ever take exotic vacations or build anything fancy and just live, you know. But you could live. Yeah I, I, yeah, I could survive. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I'm I could, in the same boat. I, I have to say, I, I don't have enough passive income to be able to do all the cool things that you just mentioned. But if I were to stop working today, I'm 33 years old. That's pretty good compared to the rest of the world. If right. I were to stop working today, I'd have enough passive income to cover the mortgage, cover the bills, cover the car payment, you know, and have enough money left over to eat and take a couple, you know, little trips out to the, you know, take my wife to dinner, so on and so forth. I could live. Right. And I wouldn't necessarily be scrambling for that next couple bucks. I'd have enough coming in. Now, I'm building the business to get to the point where I can take the big vacations and do all the cool right. stuff on that passive income, but I'm not quite there yet. Same here. And that's, and that's okay. That's okay. Well, and but that's you were able to these, escape your corporate job. And that's right. Cool. Let's talk and about that's where all these stuff. other things come from, right? So you then, um, you once you have that freedom, you don't have to exchange your time for money anymore in the traditional corporate sense. Then you can think, okay, now what can I do in addition? I'm already marketing for properties. I'm already buying uh, rental properties. Well, I can decide to flip some. I can decide to wholesale some or hotel, whichever one you prefer, whichever makes sense for your scenario. Mm -hmm. And like you're in the Midwest, I'm in the Mid-South, maybe you might call it the numbers just tend to work where we live and there's so they many do. people they you know you, even with the hot markets that we're into now you can still buy properties where the numbers work well below the one percent rule in the right neighborhoods you know class b neighborhoods b plus a minus is where i want to keep my rentals forever but that doesn't mean i don't play in class c properties where i can i can get it under contract then either take title to it and wholesale it or wholesale or wholetail it um or when it's the right deal flip it because there's there's a lot of you know typically for me if it's if if i can make 20 or 25 to 30 net of everything um on a property then i'll i'll i'll, I'll you know flip it i'll actually do the rehab but if i don't i'm not gonna make that much and it's gonna take me six to eight months to do it why not just assign that to somebody else or you know take title and sell it to somebody else who's willing to do to, to take the take uh, the I think fair heard, risk right yeah and right. it is. And that's exactly what it is. We, I bought one this morning for 330 grand. It needs 80. And I think the ARV is somewhere between 450 and 480. Uh -huh. So, you know, that could mean that we could make 20 grand on the deal or we could make 50 grand on the deal. Best case scenario. But I don't know. It's a big risk. And I'd right. hate to go do all that work to make 20 or less. So at this point, we're kind of considering wholesaling it. And it won't sure. be a huge wholesale because the numbers are already kind of skinny. But if I can make, you know, say 500 bucks and just walk away, you know, that might be, might be half of what the profit is after the six months. Now it right. could be what, much more. And that's where your risk, you know, risk versus reward comes into play. But uh, yeah, I'm with you, man. hundred percent. That makes sense. So it's the whole, um, your, your, it's the quick nickel versus the long dime, which is why I like hoteling so much because it's the best way I know to make a, a, a long dime mm -hmm. or, or a quick, quick dime. Yeah, that's what quick I want. Time. A quick right. So are you doing a lot of wholesaling then or you're buying and, and then either throwing a sign in the yard or just doing like a basic clean out or like what does your wholesale consist of? Let me ask you that. 
It's a great question. So I, I think I heard in one of your previous episodes, y'all you, you, refer to it as um, n- knocking the ugly off of it or something like that's that. That's it. We uh, knocked the that ugly was, off of it. Right. I love that. Um, that's pretty similar. Um, what uh, what I do is uh, me and a partner that um, we go in together, um, we'll, we'll buy it and take title. And then um, we effectively wholesale it to other investors. We don't go to the retail market. We just sell it uh, to another investor who wants to do a rehab with it. And so now why would you take the property down? And, and mm-hmm. we do that too occasionally. And typically right. we only do that when we have to do that. Right. But I'd imagine you're doing that too, right? I mean, if you can wholesale it before oh, yeah. you close on it, why would sure. it? You have there's, no, there's no sense to do that. But sometimes when you slow down to sell a property, you can sell it for more. That's a good Other, point. Right. So that's one of the big lessons that I learned is if you can make that quick dime, make it. But if, it, if you could wait three more weeks and have someone come in for ten, twenty thousand dollars more, and you can make twice the the air quote assignment fee. Um, then then that makes sense um, because a lot of times the markets that I'm working in is um, we don't have quite. I mean, we're a smaller market, and so we don't have quite the um, investor base to sell to. So I don't have the the hedge funds to sell to in, in quite the way that somebody in Atlanta or Dallas or St. Louis might have. Sure. No, that makes perfect sense. That, that's, a, that's a good point. So let's talk about these 18 properties that you acquired in, I'm sorry, 20 properties in the first 18 months. And that was basically when you were still had, you still had the corporate job, right? Yeah, I was a newbie and I, I was, um, made a couple of mistakes, but um, what I did the first 10, I think I bought, in fact, I know the first 10 I bought through a wholesaler. Um, and so that was how I was learning. And so um it averages out to I think one a month, but they came in fits and start. So I, sure. I bought um, six real quickly and I kind of figured out, you know, how to make that work and what is it really like being a landlord? What is it like to self-manage? What is it like to be an investor? And once you kind of get your head around that and you kind of get your systems in place, then you're okay, well, I'll go buy some more. And then I started buy, buying some after those 10 using more creative uh, methods where I would uh, buy either subject to the existing mortgage or with owner financing. I've done several lease options. Um, now are you instead, buying, buying lease option and then selling on lease option? Are you sandwiching them or are you just like, tell me a little I've, bit. I've about done, that. I've done a little so bit of everything. Strategies when it comes to lease. There options. is. It's so complicated. Many. I've done a little bit of, a little bit of all of it. Um, I, I, I don't like not taking title to a property. If I'm going to be an investor, I want to take title, but I have definitely seen um, and practiced this idea of wholesaling lease options or I'm taking a sandwich lease. I, I don't like sandwich leases. Uh, the only time I think I would do a sandwich lease now is if I were going to specifically do an Airbnb on the back end of it. So you take title, um, or, or no, I'm sorry, you, you take a lease telling the, the, the owner that you are going to lease it with the intent to sublet it as an Airbnb. And that was a specific scenario that I would do to solve that um, sellers problems. And basically all you're doing is you're buying them time and you're taking on the headache of running the little mini hotel. Right. That's a great point. That's so true. Awesome. Yeah. So you I've done a bunch, like five, six of them, it looks sounds like, and then you started picking up more and mm-hmm. uh, over a course of 18 months, you had picked up 20 properties, man. That's impressive. Yeah. So I just kept rolling and then I would, um, you know, as I would, I would market. And what I learned is that it, the best way to be an investor is to be able to control the deal. And so it's the same thing that you guys do in your, in your market is you market and you find motivated sellers and you figure out how to solve their problem. And sometimes it's owner financing. Sometimes it's a cash deal. Sometimes it's um, any combination thereof. And so you make, um, you just start becoming a deal maker. And, and when you're a deal maker, then that's when you have control, the most control of where you can make your money. Yeah. Isn't that funny how I was just telling, so we have a, uh, about 14, 15 students right now in one of our programs that we do a weekly coaching call with them and give them some, some uh, online course access and whatnot. And I was just telling them just literally right before this podcast that the, the longer that you're in this business, plus the amount that you are out hustling every day, equals luck and you can actually create your own luck you know it's, yeah. it's funny because you know i've been doing this full time for about four years i've been investing in real estate for close to 15 mm-hmm. and um you know it's funny because now like deals will fall in my lap you know and it's just because i've worked hard and hustled hard and i get lucky now but in the beginning i didn't have as much luck you know and the harder you work the luckier you get so sometimes I'll fall into a deal where somebody calls me and says, Hey, I just bought this one and I'm overwhelmed with other rehabs. You know, can you help me sell it? And I say, great. 
Those are my favorite. And I say, great, I got five guys lined up ready to buy something right now. What do you got? Yep. What do you want for it? And I'll, yep. either, I'll either make them an offer or we'll JV on it. And I'll send it out and we can make two, three, five, sometimes 10 grand, you know, by just sending a couple text messages or making a couple phone calls. It's kind of crazy. It's the but, monkey you know, in the middle, right? Yeah, I mean, you're, and, just, and you're a deal maker. That's yeah. just like you stated. You just become a deal maker and you become a pro mm -hmm. at it. And it's, it's really awesome. It really is. That's awesome. Yeah, well, well, and then you're, you're, you're monetizing your intellectual capital at that point because people come to you as a problem solver. That's exactly right. And that's, and that's all I do, man. I just try to solve problems for motivated sellers, for cash buyers, and at this point, you know, students as well and teach them how to do it. So, yeah, I love that. I love it. So you escaped corporate America in a, in a kind of a strange way because you were getting ready to get out, but they let you go. But it was for mm -hmm. the best, like you said, it was the best day of your life. I love that. And you're building wealth with passive income. Um, not just for the 1%. So what does that mean? What does that mean? So this, we have this idea in, in America that we spend a lot of time talking about um, the 1% or thinking or the 1% gets a lot of attention. And in all reality, you and me and the people who are listening to this podcast are never going to be one of the 1%. We are not going to be Mark Zuckerberg. We're not going to be Warren Buffett. We, if we would have, if we had the mental capacity or the luck, so to speak, um, to do that, then we would have already done it. We would have done it. No, I'm with we you. It's done. kind of a depressing thought, but you're right. I am never going to be a one percenter, but that's okay. Right. It's However, okay. we can still be wealthy. In fact, I was, a lot of people would consider us wealthy already. Um, so what what we can do is um, being living like Kings, like so many, I mean, anybody in America who's listening to this ha probably is already living like a King or queen compared to most of the world. But even compared to ourselves, um, we can live a much better lifestyle if we just do what the other three or 4% are doing. So 95% of people are order takers. They are just out there living or enabling somebody else to live their dream. So we can have dreams for ourselves. We can lead a life of our own design by saying, you know what, what can I do to help bring more value to the marketplace? How can I um, invest in myself so that I can have the intellectual capital to be a deal maker? And when you do so, um, start some sort of business like what you guys have done with your wholesaling and, and um, um, your consulting business. Um, you are now providing value to people way over and above what you could do just by yourself because you're serving other people. And that allows you to earn income far above what you could have done just as a um, real estate investor um, if, if, if all you ever did was, was to buy and hold. Um, so now you, what you're doing is you're having a mix of active and passive income. So I love passive income because I want to have that residual income base, but I'm not going to just sit around and sit on the beach. I mean, that's not, um, I, I'll, most people wouldn't find that rewarding. What you do then is you go out into the marketplace and you provide value and by exchanging that, um, or sharing that knowledge base with, with the space, with, with, with the, with the world, then you can build a very successful business with, with a very nice lifestyle design. You have the freedom to up and go wherever you want to go when you want to go there. And that's what the other four to 5% of people out there can do if they wish. No, that's a great point. That's a great point. I love that, Paul. That makes, that makes a world of sense. I love that. So let's talk about, um, Let's talk about what we were talking about before we started the podcast on, you know, the, the great thing about single families and how there's some, you know, there can be different strategies, not only to buy those properties, but to sell those properties and how, you know, the average person really should be leveraging these different strategies because not everybody has a ton of money in the bank and not everybody knows another individual that has a ton of money in the bank, right. which they can essentially convert into becoming a private investor for them. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of these other strategies and let's hear some of the strategies that you are using to acquire properties. I'd love to hear that. Okay, sure. So I kind of have a hierarchy. When I'm looking at a property, uh, here's my um, order of preferences. I want to buy the property with owner financing first. If I can get owner financing, that's my favorite way to buy properties. If for some reason that doesn't work out, which many times it doesn't, most people don't naturally want to sell owner financing, then I'll try and see if I can do subject to the existing mortgage. And when it makes sense. I, I don't make that. Uh, I'm, I'm not one of the typical guru types that, that um, tout that as this like um, silver bullet solution, but that's the next in the hierarchy because that's when I'm using somebody else's financing. Um, second, if that doesn't work, then I might try and then I'll go down to, okay, kind of do a cash offer. And then if the cash offer um, is what works, um, then I'll figure out how to uh, monetize that particular deal that I've taken, um, uh, taken up under contract. So then I monetize it. Do I, 
Do I assign it? Do I take title and slow down and make more off of it because I can have a bigger buyer base or can I sell it retail? Or do I flip it by putting some work into it and, and assigning it or, 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 or selling it to the retail market in fixed up shape and complete fair market value ARV? Um, those are kind of like the, the hierarchy that I go down. And then if I can't solve any of those problems, I'll do the much more creative aspects of lease options and taking options and whatnot. But that's usually, um, I'm actually stepping away from those more and more because they're, they're oftentimes more complicated and they drag out longer than I care they drag to. Out, and, it's, and it creates a lot of work. But I love, I love what you had, like how you had put that. So you start, your number one goal is to buy on owner financing. Yep. And then you stated that if that doesn't work, then you'll try to buy it subject to. And then right. last but not least, yep. you make the cash offer, which is kind of the opposite of what most people do. Right. Most people come in with the cash offer and if that doesn't, and this is at least how I do it, I come in with the cash offer first. And if that doesn't work because it's usually very low. I got to yep. buy great and sell good as a wholesaler. So I'll come up with the cash offer first mm -hmm. and then I'll offer and then I'll see, okay, well maybe I can pay you a little bit more if you can, you know, finance it to me or if maybe I can just pay you to kind of go away and, but keep your, your existing financing place, which is right. two, but you kind of flip that upside down, which is interesting to me. You come in with, Hey, I'm going to buy this owner financing first. And if that doesn't work, then I'm going to do subject two. And then if that doesn't work, then I'm going to make you the cash offer. So it's basically the exact opposite of what I'm doing. But it yeah. works and I love it. And there's really but no right or wrong way to do it. There That's isn't, but what's cool about it. The there's no right or wrong way to do right. it. Do what works for you and what makes money. And that's it. That's all there is to it. That's and oftentimes cool. what I'm doing is I'm making that those offers um, all at the same time. So I actually use a three option letter of intent. Okay. Um, and, and, unless they're just dripping with motivation and it's just so clear that the only thing that's going to solve their problem is one of those techniques. Um, what I'll do if there's, you know, so many people we talk to, they're kind of like on the edge of motivation. They're not quite motivated enough yet. So uh, what I'll do then is I actually send them a three letter option of intent and everybody I talk to gets an offer. Even if they tell me, get off, get off my line. Wait, wait, I send them a letter that says, I'm, Thank you for letting me come view your house. I'm, you know, I, I say something personal in the letter and then I give them a three option letter. Of yeah. Intent. Three, let, three option letter of 10. We use it too in our business, not as much as we should, but we have it and we use it occasionally and it's a great tool. And especially if you really want to push somebody to one of those options, yes. you know, you can make the other options not nearly as, as, you know, and, as, and as do you, good of do you find that um, when you make the, uh, our two year options, financing or lease option? Yeah. So we have the cash offer. And mm -hmm. I, I kind of change it up too. It depends on the property and the seller, but yep. typically, typically it's a cash offer, um, which will be the lowest. Mm -hmm. And then um, sometimes I'll use lease option, but I'm not a big mm -hmm. fan of lease option to be honest with you. So typically what I'll do is I'll do a principal only yep. uh, interest or um, uh, seller financing. And yep. that will be, um, you know, a option little two. bit, a little bit, um, you know, better of an offer. Um, and then I'll do um, a principal and interest, but those, I typically stretch those out for like 15 or 20 years, yep. whereas the, same, the principal thing. only maybe five or 10 years, something along those lines. So obviously the cash offer is, um, you know, what I kind of push for cause I like to just wholesale. Um, sure. typically, so we use the birth strategy whenever we're yep. buying our rentals and I don't really care if they subject to, um, or owner finance me the deal because I'm going to be refinancing it anyway after I fix right. it. So we right. just have private money lenders that lend us to purchase and then we'll rehab it. And then um, our banks are pretty, pretty cool. We work with a bunch of them, but um, as long as we can show um, that we've improved the property, then they give us what's called an entrepreneurial credit. And basically they'll lend uh, 70 to 75% of the appraised amount, which, mm -hmm. uh, which is awesome because we're not buying anywhere near that. We're basically sure. buying at 50 cents on the dollar of mm -hmm. the appraised amount, but then we have to go fix it up. So we're buying at, you know, maybe 15, 20% discount to the market. And then we're putting in, uh, putting in some money into fixing it up, but we're increasing the value at the same time. Very similar. So, I mean, it's just crazy how many, how many ways there are to make money in real estate. I love it. So you're doing very similar things, but you kind of are doing it different than me and it's okay. And that's great. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's cool. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned those are a couple of the ways, um, owner financing subject to cash offer. Those are the ways that you like to go into the properties. Now right. let's talk about once you get control of it, regardless of how you buy it, right. there's also lots and lots of ways to then make money on that deal. If you don't right. want to add it to your rental portfolio, um, you had mentioned assigning a contract, you can double close, 
Um, those are both ways of wholesaling and you can also wholetail a property. You can yep. also sell it on owner financing or on a lease. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many ways. So what ways do you like, do you prefer um, to do if you're not adding to your rental portfolio? Because that's obviously the goal to sure. get the passive income built up totally. to, to create real wealth. But if you're wanting to get, a, you know, make the quick, the quick dime over the slow nickel, yep. um, what do you if like? I'm making, if I'm making the, um, if I'm taking title to it and I intend to, to well, uh, if I take title and I'm not wholesaling it, I, I'll, I'll see if wholesaling it is makes sense or if doing a flip on it makes sense. And a lot of that dep depends on the value of the property. The higher in the, 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 the property, the more likely flipping makes more sense because that's where you tend to get the bigger spreads. Um, on, the, on the lower end, um, wholesaling is just um, so easy and you can sell it almost near fair market value. Um, even when it only needs paint and carpet. And so I'll let somebody else go do, go do put lipstick on a pig and I don't have to do any work. And sometimes I, I don't even, I don't even put utilities on. I mean, I, I just wait. I just, I just let the market bring me the highest offer. Um, and so, and, and, and that might only be a month or two. Um, sometimes I'll, um, if it doesn't sell as fast as I think it should, then we'll, you know, take the ugly off of it. It's just, like you say, I really love that. I'm going to start using it in my business. Use it, man. Knock the ugly off it. And a lot yeah, of times that's it. just carpet or paint. It's, it's, yeah, light, it's, it's just lightweight, right? Yeah. Sometimes it's a roof and windows. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, um, it's fixing a driveway. You know, it just, yeah. it, it, it is exactly what it states. Knock the ugly off it. Get, and a lot of times it might be just fixing the biggest problem. So sometimes you might have a property that, yeah, it might need paint, carpet, might need a kitchen, it might need a bath, but it's got a really bad foundation issue. Sometimes we'll buy a property, just fix that issue. And then yep. we'll sell it to a rehabber because all the scary is gone at that point. He knows how to fix the the walls and the floors and put a new kitchen and a new bath in, but he might not know the first thing about peer in a house and, and yeah. getting rid of a huge crack or something along like along those lines. So yeah, knock the ugly off it, man. Make it, make it look like a good deal for another investor or a retail buyer. I love it. So yeah, we're, exactly. we both do that the same. That's cool. Wholesaling exactly. is a great strategy. And we, we basically do about a third, a third, a third, a third. We do a third wholesale, a third um, rental, and then a third rehab. But uh, I think there's a little bit of overlap with both the wholesale and the rehab when it comes to wholesaling. And for yeah, those- they, they definitely kind of blend together sometimes depending they on- blend how. together, absolutely. Yeah. And for those that don't know what a wholesale is, is it's, it's very simple. It's basically buying a property wholesale. So you're going directly to the seller. And then you are um, essentially trying to find a retail buyer. Now that could still be an investor, but you're mm -hmm. basically taking it to the market. You're listing it on the MLS or you are listing it on, you know, some sort of a marketplace that has a lot of, of interested shoppers and buyers out there. And you're basically trying to get, you know, close to retail. So they mix the two words, wholesale, retail, it equals wholesale. So I love it, man. Paul, that's awesome that you're doing that as well. Um, again, mm -hmm. there's so many different strategies. So Paul, let me ask you this. Um, you, you had sent over a little pamphlet uh, before we had done the, the, uh, the, the podcast and the interview. And I love reading some of these things off. One of the things you had written on here was five things you can do today to create a new money mindset. So mm -hmm. what are those five things, man? Tell me. Okay. The five things for the new money mindset are number one, separate time from money. This idea that you go to work and you are exchanging your time for money is the 95%. If you want to live outside and of the status quo and you want to live a life completely of your design, then you need to figure out how to take the knowledge that you have or uh, build a business or something that separates uh, trying to exchange your time for money. Time is not equal to money. We're told it is, but it's not true. Um, how, how, if time were money, then how, how is Warren Buffett so, so wealthy? He learned, That's he learned such a how great to, point. He got the same amount of time in the day that we do. He learned how to make money while he sleeps. And once you learn how to make money while you sleep, then that's how you can create serious wealth. And so that's a money mindset that you want to switch. And number two is switch from looking for piles of money to finding streams of money. So okay. um, that's why rentals are, we all kind of end up coming back to the real wealth generator is rentals because you get these streams of money. It could also be notes. Um, so I, I play with the note, the note space as well. Um, they tend to run out over time, but it is still ways to make streams of money over time that don't require any, any hardly any time of my own. Yeah. 
And then the third one is value is subjective. And so people ask me all the time, why would somebody sell a house to you for such a low discount? Because they don't want the same thing out of it that, that, that you do. Value is subjective. And so the way I, the best way I've ever heard this explained is the ice cream analogy. So what's your favorite flavor of ice cream, David? I just, I like strawberry and vanilla. So call, let's go Strab with vanilla. Strawberry vanilla. Okay. So it's your favorite flavor. What is a flavor of ice cream that you would not eat no matter what? Chocolate. I'm not a big fan of chocolate. So you don't like chocolate. So you're a weirdo. Um, and so, you <laughs> have, uh, um, okay. That's so right. let's, right. let's say you have two scoops of chocolate right in front of you, but I have one scoop of vanilla. Which I would, would trade you, you in a heartbeat. Have? Well, and why was that? Because you, I, I have, I just, I don't what? find value in those two scoops of, of chocolate. I don't like them, even though I have a hundred percent more ice cream than you. Because you have bad taste it. is what it turns out to be. But, right. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the point being is value is subjective. And so value is subjective. I love that. That's great. Don't ever assume that the other party wants what it is that you want. So you don't want to actually apply the golden rule. You actually want to apply what I've heard referred to as the platinum rule is do unto others as they would have them do unto themselves. Oh, that's a, I love that. Paul, that's yeah. great. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. So okay, number four, subjective. what do you got for number four? Number four is you don't actually want money. You want what money can do for you. So I, I, can't, I can't disagree with you on that one. That's a good one. So the best way I've found to make that point clear is um, we've talked about Warren Buffett. I think he's what, 87, 88 years old, really old. One mm -hmm. of the richest men in the world. Would you trade places with him right now? If you could live in his body, have all his wealth, do whatever you wanted to with your day and the money, whatever you want, would you trade places with him? That's a great question. I don't think I would. I don't know if I, if I really want to be 87. I like being 33. That's right. I mean, you don't want the money. What, what you want is um, you, you want what money can do for you. And right. so if I just gave you money, that doesn't make you happy. You want what money can actually do for you. Right. And that's a, that's a that, man, Paul, you nailed it. That's a really good point. I love that. Yep. Okay. And so the last one is you have plenty of money for all the things you truly want. Now so, explain that to and, me real quick. And that's the one people probably push back on, on, for, on me the most. And I tell my same coaching clients this a lot. And I say, um, because this is what I tell people all the time, um, go and find a deal and then go and find the money. And this is the way I try and explain it to them. Um, when you go to a, um, uh, to a bank, um, when you're buying your primary residence, you don't actually have the money to buy that, buy that primary residence most of the time. But it's completely normal for people to, to say, okay, well, I intend to buy it. So I'm going to go, um, get a bank loan. Yeah. I'm going to go get a loan contract. Right. right. And I'm gonna, that's I'm okay. Gonna... We, well, that's acceptable. Right. But people won't do that for an investment property. It, it, it scares them. I, I'm not going to make an offer on, for a property that I don't have, have yet. And, and they say, well, when I'm working with a bank, they have that money reserved for me. No, they don't. It's a pre-approval. They've, that's not really worth <laughs> that's it. That's right. That's so true. Right. The pre that's why they we don't have it like, for you. They're waiting for you to come in and sign all the papers. Yeah. And once the property's under contract, now you have something of value. Now right. you have something that is marketable and has equitable value in the marketplace. Then you take that and then they're willing to go through desktop underwriting. Then they're ready to take it to committee and figure out if they will actually then lend you the money. That's right. The that's way. true. They won't do that prior though. No. Nope. They give you what's called the pre-approval. That's such a great point. I love yep. that. Well, when, when we go and buy uh, investment properties, we do the same thing. Well, not, I'm going to go to a private lender. Or I'm going to go someplace else. Go, go talk to a private lender and say, um, would you lend me $100,000 on the rental property? But I don't know what it is yet. Just go ahead and lend Probably it Probably not. They're going to no, say, no. They want to see the buying. deal. Right. They want to see the deal. So my, when I say that is if you really want money uh, or you really want something badly enough, you will go and do whatever it takes to go get it. But you have to go get that thing first to find the money. Such a good point, Mark, or Paul, I'm sorry, Paul. I'm an apostle uh, or a disciple. <laughs> no, 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 no. I was at a house this morning and I bought a house off a guy named Mark. So I just have his. In there. But, <laughs> Paul, that's awesome. I love the five things. And that's things you can do today to create a new money mindset. So let's review those. Those are such a great thing. Separate time for money. Number mm -hmm. one, switch from piles of money to streams of money. Yep. That's probably one of my favorite. Value is subjective. And that's a great one too. These are all good. You don't actually want money. You want what money can do for you. That's number four. That's great. And number five, you have plenty of money for all the things that you truly want. Because you mm -hmm. just, yeah, I love that. That's, all of those are awesome, uh, Paul. Very, very cool. So also you had mentioned why finding a tribe of like-minded people can you know, set you up for, for greater success. Can you, can you explain that a little bit to me? Why does that, I don't understand that necessarily. 
Okay. Yeah. So, um, have you probably heard the quote from Jim Rohn that you're the average of the five people you spend the most time around? Absolutely. So it's a great go, quote. Most of us need to go upgrade our, our, our tribe, our group. And so, um, I make it a point to try and be the dumbest person in the room wherever I go. And, and if I'm, that's not consistently the case, then I'm not going to the right places. And so I am always trying to find the people who are pushing themselves and uh, taking uh, personal growth as a serious investment as much as I can. I'm, I'm a member of, I, I run masterminds that for which the, the, um, that I'm like the, the, the mentor of. I'm also a member, a member of other masterminds for which I am being mentored. Sure. And, so I'm always trying to meet and find people because one of the greatest assets that we have is our network. Um, any business you're in, but especially real estate, is not actually about real estate. It's about the people that we meet in the deals. You mentioned it before. How did you? How do deals just kind of land in your lap? Because you've met people and you've created value in the marketplace, and they know that when they have a problem, they can come talk to you, and you can help put something together. And I want to do that in my life and every aspect of life that I'm, that I'm working in is I want to surround myself with other people who might bring something to the table that I, that I don't have. So sure, um, sure. Uh, anytime I have a problem in my business that I want to grow and kind of, I figure I'm kind of stuck. Um, I take it to my mastermind and we go, well, I'm in the hot seat and I ask and just this morning I was on the hot seat. I'm trying to grow my, uh, my business. I'm trying to get my message out to the marketplace more what should I be doing? I'm, I'm limited. Uh, I feel in my messaging. And so they gave me several ideas of how to expand my messaging. And so, awesome. and, and one of those is to be on more podcasts. I mean, so it's, it's no mistake of, of, of what I'm doing is I'm trying to meet people and share value and figure out how I can help other people that I talk to. And then, and by some value in the, in the universe, I'm not sure what it is. When I give value away, I get it back in spades, but I can't predict how or where. That's a, that's a great point. I, I feel the same way. When I give value away, I get it back in spades. That's a great way to put it. I totally agree. And, and you might not get it right back immediately, but it's going to can't back. really measure it, right? But, measure been, it, but it comes some, back in some way, shape or form at yeah. some point in time. Right. Yeah. That's and there's awesome. some, there's actually been studies that have tried to measure it and they, as people who donate money actually get that money back. Um, and like they, they came up with like some number, like 19% back, you know, so you get like a 19% return on your money or something, but yeah, it's kind of crazy. It, actually, but. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. Well, find a tribe. That's a great point. And I'm a member of some masterminds. You have your own, what's yours called level up. Yeah. I have a uh, one for uh, people who are trying to become, um, trying to take their, um, business, the real estate investing business to the next level. I call it level up your life mastermind. Level up your life mastermind. I love it, man. That's awesome. That's really cool. We'll have to put some information about that in our show notes today for cool. you. That sounds really cool. So, uh, Paul, a couple, couple of, uh, other things before we wrap up here. Um, three investments you can make this month to set you up for future wealth. What would you, what would you recommend to any of the listeners and viewers that we have today that, you know, are, you know, maybe new to the game. They, they may not have 20 or 30 or 50 rentals like, like we do. Mm -hmm. and they may not know a whole lot about, you know, about real estate just quite yet. So what would be three investments that you can make this month to set up for future wealth? So, uh, and it was ironic is none of these will be real estate specific, but this is apply to anybody. So if you're listening to this and you're um, figuring out what is it that I can do to do investments and make a difference in my life this month, Number yeah. one is to invest in yourself. You have to be, and this is um, um, from Warren Buffett and from other people like Warren Buffett, is that you have to figure out how to make more value in the marketplace. And the way you do that is you invest in yourself first. It's this whole idea that, that you, you put on the oxygen mask first so you can serve others around you. You got to figure out um, what skill sets that you need to be more valuable in the marketplace. Love it. Okay. And number, number two is invest in your network. And we've been talking about this a lot already, but you want to grow and improve your circle of influence by um, going out. And if uh, I say go to the local RIA, go to chamber groups, go to um, conferences. I probably went to 30 plus conferences um, about real estate investing. And I thought I was going there to learn something, which I certainly did. But the biggest value I ended up getting out of that was the people I met there and the relationships that were forged. That's a, man, I feel the same way about podcasting. I'm meeting new people all the time 
And, you know, I feel like I'm learning something new every day, probably every hour. Cause I, I embrace failing. I, I really do. I don't care if sure. I fail. It just brings me that much closer to success. And, you know, podcasting is a great way to meet new people all over the country that are doing the same thing as me. So That's right. I, I love that one. Invest in yourself, number one, and then invest in your network, number two. So what's the last one there? What's number three? Number three is invest in assets that create, that create streams of income. So this That's is probably this my idea. favorite one. Right? Yeah, and so this is this idea of um, whether it be a business. Like, so wholesaling is not necessarily about real estate. Wholesaling is a business. And it's a business. marketing business of all yes. businesses. Yes. That's right. You, you market. Tell everyone that. If you are going to be a wholesaler, you are getting into the marketing business. Yes, you are also a real estate investor, folks. But at the end of the day, your business is marketing. Love it. Um, yeah, I agree so much. And, and so, and what you're actually um, investing in there is in the systems in the background to do your um, marketing and to track your leads and to convert those leads into deals. And the, 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 you could turn around and sell that business to somebody else because there are systems in place that do so. So that is the asset there is your business operations, not necessarily the real estate assets that you sold um, per transaction. No, I, I totally agree. I love, I love that, man. I think that actually is three awesome investments, probably the three best things you could do um, this month, as you stated, to set up for future wealth. So I'm going to recap, invest in yourself. You got to create more value in your marketplace. And that's, that's basically what investing in yourself is. Um, invest in your network, you know, build the network. You had mentioned, it was a Jim Rome that had that quote. I don't even know. Yeah. You yeah. are the sum of the five people that you spend the most time around or something along those lines. Yeah. I think I screwed it up, but you guys get the point. Good paraphrase. Right. And then number three, invest in assets that create streams of income. So earlier you had mentioned switch from piles of money to streams of money. And that's a great mindset change. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a great point. You know, streams of money. So this is, I want to mention something real quick, Paul, that I always joke around with, um, with, with not only my friends, but more importantly, bank tellers. Because um, the bank tellers are the ones that write my cashier's checks from my line of credit whenever I'm going to buy a property. So they see me come in the bank all the time and I'm pulling out anywhere from 30 grand to $300,000 in large sums. And it's borrowed money. It's not my money necessarily. Um, but they see this as like, man, this guy's rich, just pulling out yep. these big chunks of change to go buy some real estate. And you know, at the end of the day, I'm either going to be wholesaling it, I'm going to be adding it to my rental portfolio, or I'm going to be flipping it. Right. And that's basically what I do as an investor. Those are the right. three main things you could, you could branch off from those three things and do a hundred little things. But at the end of the day, those are the three things that I do. And um, it's funny because I'm all about passive income and building a portfolio of rentals that put out, as you state, the streams of money versus the piles of money. But the funny thing is, and I'm going to, I'm going to wrap this up because I can talk for hours and hours. But the funny thing is, is, is whenever I see people that or I'm at the bank and they, and they see me pulling out a check to go buy some property is I, I always like to ask a simple question. I said, would you rather have this money right here that I'm pulling out or, you know, 500, a thousand, 1500, depending on how much that money is a month, the rest of your life. And 99% of the time people say, I want that money right there. I'd rather have that 60 grand than 900 bucks a month for the rest of my life. Right. And I ask them, okay, well, I get it. And guess what? You're not abnormal for thinking that. Most people think that way. But then I follow up with a really, really fun and, and even more important question is, and I tell people is, let's say that you're able to build up a passive income portfolio of 20 to 25,000 a month. Okay. Mm -hmm. Seems like a ton of money, but in all reality, it's not. Okay. Right. What can you not do that the millionaire down the street can, or basically what can he do that you can't? And everyone ponders about it. And they're like, well, I couldn't really have five houses and 10 boats and two airplanes. And I'm like, but do you really need all that for one? And for two, couldn't you take a vacation to all five of those houses and rent them and lease the boat and or the airplane? for the day or the week that you want to use it. You don't necessarily have to own all these things to enjoy the benefits of them. You can still live like the ultra rich by having this steady stream of income coming in every month. And I think after I explain it to them, I, I get people to change their mindset. Well, actually, now that you say it that way, I don't really want this $60,000 check. I'd rather have the eight or 900 bucks a month for the rest of my life. And it's awesome because mm -hmm. it's actually gets people to really change the way they look at 
as you stated, large sums of money versus streams of money. And right. it's really cool. It really is. So uh, a good summary for that would be to buy value and rent luxury. So uh, the, we think that we want to own all these um, boats and uh, these um, big mansions and whatnot, but they're, those things cost a lot of money to maintain. It's a lot. And how often do you actually end up using all these toys that, that we, that we want to go out and buy? No, buy, buy for value, buy something that's practical and, and that you can live in and, and enjoy your life and your family. And then when you have this streams of money, you can use those streams of money to go rent the luxury. To rent or lease. That's, that's exactly right. And that, and it changes everything because really, so my goal is a hundred thousand a month in passive income. And I set nice. my goal super high. Yep. I don't know if I'll ever get there. I hope I do, you know, but at this point in time, I'm, um, I'm over 10,000 a month, which is awesome. And I'm growing every month. But you know, if I can get to like 20 or 25,000, there's truly nothing that I can't do that the guy down the street that's got 10 million bucks can, you know, right. I've, it's, it's awesome. It really is. And I think once you explain it to people, a lot of times it changes their, the way they look at things. So, well, Paul, it's been a pleasure. I've learned a lot on this episode. I know the viewers are going to love this episode as well. Um, check out Paul guys. If you want to learn more about his podcast, it's called ready investor one. Paul also has a mastermind called Level Up Your Life Mastermind. Um, Paul, you also have some online video courses and some support group. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that if you don't mind. Sure thing. Yeah. I, I um, have my own course about how to become, how to start or launch your real estate investing life to basically I call it uh, REI pathway, your roadmap to freedom. And it's the X, the steps from A to Z on how to do exactly what I did, which is use real estate as a way to branch away, branch out and, and launch your life outside of the corporate America life. And it goes into the details of actually how to do it, not just these conceptual ideas. And I wish I could do it. Love it. I love it. So how would somebody go about finding, uh, finding that information? Paul? Sure thing. So what I, what I did is I created a, a website for your, um, just for the listeners here. So pauldavidthompson.com slash DPI podcast. So it's short for uh, your podcast and all your users can go out there and get a, a free a three option letter of intent and find out more information, how to engage with me if they wish. Oh, that's awesome, man. You're giving away a three option letter of intent as well. Love mm -hmm. it. Providing value. That's what mm -hmm. we're talking about, guys. Value is subjective. Provide value. Invest in yourself. So pauldavidthompson.com forward slash DPI podcast. Is that right, Paul? That's right. You got it. Awesome. I nailed it. Cool. Well, again, Paul is an investor doing big things. He is out of Little Rock, Arkansas. And Paul, it was a pleasure having you on the show today. We got to talk about a lot of cool things. Um, I loved hearing the five things that you can do today to create a new money mindset, as well as the three investments you can make this month to set up for future wealth. Those provided me with a ton of value, and I am sure that they provided the, the listeners and the viewers with a lot of value today, too. Paul, it was a pleasure. Thanks for coming on the show. Until Thanks, next David. Time, it was a blast. Anything else that you want to add before we end? I'm good to go, David. Thanks for having me on. It was a real pleasure. Yeah, it was a pleasure on my end too, Paul. Well, thank you so much. Until next time, guys, check us out, discountpropertyinvestorpodcast.com. And if you're new to real estate investing and you want to learn how to uh, wholesale real estate, we have a free course, freewholesalecourse.com. Check it out, guys. Until next time, we'll see you then. Thanks for listening to the Discount Property Investor Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, share, and subscribe to help us reach a wider audience. To jumpstart your real estate investing career, please visit freewholesalecourse.com, the most complete free course on wholesaling real estate ever. We would also appreciate it if you left us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. Thank you in advance for your support. And remember, you make your money when you buy and you get paid when you sell. Now let's go build some wealth.